opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you, it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say it, amen. amen. Praise Lord. Well, welcome to Bible study tonight. Welcome those of you who are streaming in live. Tonight, we're going to begin our grace series here on Wednesday night. So um, I'm going to be talking like 15 minutes more <laughs> because you can't do it in 30 minutes. So 15 minutes more. So I'll, our, we'll, we'll go 45 minutes tonight, uh, 7.15 to 8. And tonight, I want to start this series. I w I'm calling it the whole series Secure in Grace. It may be the most radical series that I've ever taught being secure in grace. And each night I'll give a subtopic so you'll know what we're going to be after. Tonight we're going to be dealing with this issue, this question. Can sin cause you to lose your salvation? Can sin cause you to lose your salvation? And uh, we're just going to dig into this. And, and let me say to you, right and wrong that we're, we're dealing with is determined by the Bible not by the norms and values of the world. So when somebody says, well, I think this, I think that, that's not what we're trying to do here. It is so important that we get in the Bible, find out what the Bible says. We believe the Bible. Amen. Now, there might be others who don't believe, but we believe the Bible. And my job is to make sure that we, we, we can prove what the Word has to say concerning this subject. But I want to make sure you hear this. You are secure in grace. You are secure in grace. So let's deal with this subject. Can sin cause you to lose your salvation? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I want to look at this in the uh, King James and the New Living Translation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. First in the King James, and he says this, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, all one peace, sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole, watch this, spirit, your whole soul, your whole body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God is faithful. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. So God is saying, I'm going to do this. Let's read this in the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation says uh, this. He says, now may the God of peace make you holy. That's what it means here when he says, use the word sanctified. May the God of peace, this is so interesting. The God of peace has committed to making you holy. God says, I'm, I'm going to make you holy. Okay? Now may, may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may, you, may your whole spirit your soul, your body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful. So that's a powerful promise where God is saying, I am accepting the responsibility of making you holy, your whole spirit, your whole soul, your whole body. So he mentions the tripart being of man. Man is a spirit. He possesses a soul and he lives in a physical body. Now, here's the part I want you to get. You know, we have kind of been trained that we're responsible for becoming holy and we're responsible for making ourselves holy. And God is saying here that I'm going to make this happen. God is saying, I am going to, to make you holy. And uh, notice in that verse of Scripture again, we are spirit beings. We have a soul. We live in a body. You are not a body, you're not a soul, you are a spirit being. That's who you are. You are a spirit, you possess a soul, that's your mind, your will, and your emotions, that's your thinker, your feeler, and your chooser. That's what your soul is. Uh, for the most part, the church has used spirit and soul interchangeably as if they were the same thing, but they're not. You are a spirit, you have a soul, okay? and you live in a physical body, a physical body. That is your earth suit, 
that gets around, gets you around in this natural world. It's kind of like driving in a car. You're not the car, but if you drive by and we're familiar with your car, we'll say, there go Jimmy, okay? But that's not Jimmy, that's the car he's riding in. Well, your, your physical body is the earth suit. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. And you, have, you are a spirit being. Say this out loud, I am a spirit. I possess a soul. I live in a physical body. When we die, your spirit and soul will leave your body. Your body remains and returns to the dust of the ground. Your spirit and soul enters into this realm where you left physical matter, and then there'll be spiritual matter, and it's just a wonderful thing. You're going to really, really enjoy it. And so he has committed, he has made a commitment to make it happen. So immediately, he's moving us into the place where we're trusting God. Now, when you get born again, your spirit is sanctified and perfected forever. When you get born again, the day you get saved, the day you believe and say, Jesus, come into to my, my, my life, the part of you that was impacted was your spirit. Your spirit now is made holy and perfect. So you are already one-third perfect. <laughs> your spirit is perfect once you get born again. Your spirit is holy once you get born again, all right? Let's, let me show you something here, and I think we have, have time to do this. Hebrews chapter 10, if you have this in your Bible. Let's see what the Bible has to say about this. Hebrews chapter 10. And this is foundation for where we're going. Hebrews chapter 10, the one thing I want to show you is that we, there's one sacrifice for sin forever, one time sanctif sanctified, one time perfected. All right, now notice this. I, I am saying to you that it's going, the sacrifice is the body of Jesus Christ. Watch this, verse 5, Hebrews 10, 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifices and offerings thou what is not, but a body has thou prepared me. And then he goes to verse 10. He says, <clears throat> he says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. The body of Jesus Christ was sacrificed for us. Verse 11, and every priest standing daily ministereth and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. So now he refers to the priest back in the day when they were receiving at the altar the goat, the sheep, the different birds. Those were the sacrifices he was referring to. And he says none of those sacrifices that they offered at the altar could get rid of sin. But it was that one-time sacrifice of the body of Jesus that got rid of sin forever. Look at this, verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, so you and I, when we got born again, our spirit is sanctified and perfected forever because of what Jesus has done. Jesus is the final sacrifice and when you believe Jesus and accept him into your heart, then your spirit is made brand new. The new creation comes in. The old man moves. The new creation comes in, and you're born again. All right? You're born again. You're born again because of what Jesus did. If Jesus never died on that cross and, and sacrificed his body for us, there would be no way that anybody could get born again. In the Old Testament, nobody got born again. In the New Testament, after Jesus was raised from the dead, ascended on high, took his seat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, now men can get born again and their spirits can be sanctified, made holy. Your spirit, man, is holy. Your spirit, you are, that is a new creation on the inside of you. That's a new, <laughs> glory to God, that's a new creation. Your old man is gone, your new man is there. That's a new creation. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Now, here we go. We good? Here we go. Since you aren't saved by your own goodness, your lack of goodness can't unsave you. 
Oh, somebody don't believe in that. Well, okay, well, let me ask you a question. Were you saved by your goodness? Or were you saved because of your goodness? So did God save you because you were so good? You weren't saved because of your goodness. But yet, after you get saved, people now begin to come tell you, and they say, well, you see, you're not being good. So you, you're not going to be saved no more because you're not being good. No, 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 no. I wasn't saved by my goodness in the first place. I'm not going to be unsaved because of my goodness. My goodness didn't determine my salvation. Are you following me now? Let me say it again. Since you are saved by your, since you are not saved by your own goodness, what does the Bible say? We were saved by what? Grace. And we got it through what? So you were saved and you didn't deserve it. It was a favor for you to be able to get saved. And uh, it was not by your works. Your lack of goodness can't unsave you. And there are people that think, I, my goodness is what saved you. Now, now, that doesn't mean you go crazy, but you need to understand your lack of goodness is not going to unsave you because you weren't saved by goodness. I think I've said that enough. Amen? You got it. All right, now. So if you confess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are born again. If you confess faith, it's this simple. Lord Jesus, I have faith in you and I receive you now. Born again. If you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, born again. If you confess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, born again. Born again. You don't have to do a goody-goody. You don't have to do any. Born again. I almost cracked up yesterday on the news. They had this story about the priest has got to go and baptize all these people over again because he used the wrong words. And then, it, it, because you use the wrong words, your baptism, it, 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 it didn't take. <laughs> I need to preach to him. You confess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're born again. Now, here's the key. Since faith is the issue, faith is the issue. How'd you get born again? By faith. By faith in Jesus Christ, you became a born-again Christian. Not because you deserved it, not because of your goodness, not because you acted right. One day you decided, I have faith in Jesus Christ, and got born again. And I'm glad of that because I'll never forget it. I'm ashamed to say it, but I got born again one day, and I, I, I was cussing the next day. They had to tell me, now, you can't do that no more. I'm like, well, why the blank not? I didn't know. But, but thank God that my lack of goodness didn't unsave me. Yeah. We keep looking around trying to figure out how to undo what our faith in Jesus Christ has done. My faith, by, my faith in Je by my faith in Jesus Christ, I am saved. So, so this is important. Since faith is the issue, sin doesn't cause you to lose your salvation. Ooh, I said it, didn't I? <laughs> Since faith... Since faith is the issue, sin does not cause you to lose your salvation. You know, you know, you have to be in a lot of different ways to even say that. And I'm going to show you that in just a moment because we are so self-righteous in church. We're so busy judging somebody for what they did wrong as you put blindfolders over what you do wrong. Are you ready for this? You're going to still love me after this, right? <laughs> All right, now, let, let's use an illustration here. Someone might say, I believe if you sin, you lose your salvation. I've heard people say that. I believe if you sin, you lose your salvation. And then they'll go on to watch this. You can't tell me that a person who commits or who committed a grievous sin can go to heaven. You can't tell me that. There's no way you can tell me that. <laughs> All right, let's check this out. James 4, 17. See, see, one of the problems is somehow or another, you're trying to put sin in different degrees in different categories. You're trying to say that this is a number 10 sin, and this is a number 5 sin, and this is a number 1 sin. And the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does not uh, deal with sin in degrees. And, and, you know, somebody says, well, 
you know, adultery is a greater sin than lying. The Bible doesn't say that. Somebody says, well, where murder is a, is a greater sin uh, of being deceptive. No, 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 the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does not say that. And so that's what this, this illustration is. Oh, but you can't tell me that somebody who committed a grievous sin. I mean, you can't tell me somebody that killed somebody and killed, killed, killed a whole bunch of people. You can't tell me that, 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 that they're still saved. Oh, well, <laughs> Paul made it. In fact, three of the top guys in the Bible committed murder. What? Moses committed murder. David committed murder. Huh? And the Apostle Paul himself committed murder. I believe you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right, all right? All right, so now let's, let's look at Scripture and see what Scripture says, and then you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about here. Look at James 4, verse uh, 17 in the King James and then the New Living Translation. James 4, 17, King James. He says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. All right, so you want to you wanna look at sin? So right here he says, if you know to do good and you don't do it, it's sin. Look at this in the NLT. To know, to know to do good and do it not. All right, now watch this. He says, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So that's sin. Oh, but you certainly wouldn't think about that. I mean, to have a bad attitude with a wait waitress in a restaurant, that's sin. So let's, let's, let's give a definition of sin. Sin is missing the mark. There's a mark that God has put. Sin is missing the mark. And our idea and our religious thinking about sin is what's messed a whole lot of things up. All right, now watch this now. Uh, go to Romans 14, 23. Romans 14, 23. I don't expect everybody to agree with this. I ain't got time for that. It's, it's time to rock and roll. I'm going to say the truth, and you're going to have to go and figure out between you and God whether or not you can accept it or not. Yeah. I'm right. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, been, I've been doing it. I've been living it. I understand this now, and I'm, and I'm telling you this what it is. If you listen to the whole thing tonight, you'll be fine. Now, if you turn the stream off right now because I said what I said in, in her, and you don't listen to the, the, the rest of it, you, you're going to you just, you know, you're not going to get it because there's a, there's a bunch to this story I ain't even got yet. Look at this. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. All right, now, the first two things I miss, mentioned, that covers like everybody. Whatever is uh, the, the, the first one that we talked about, the fact that to know to do good and to do it not. I mean, how many of us in this room, we, there was something we knew to do, but we didn't do it. Right. And you go up and say, man, I should have did that. I should have did that. And he said, that's sin. All right, so did you lose your salvation because... You know, you knew to do something, but you didn't do it at that particular time? Or, you know, whatever's done not of faith. I mean, how many times have you done something that was not of faith? Right. All right, that's sin. But did you lose your salvation because, you, you, know, you, you know, that's sin. That's just like the other sin. No, that's, that's not as great. No, no, God is not weighing it based like you. You have to do that in order to, to, to stick with that, 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 fal that faltered idea that you have about once saved, always saved, or not saved, or losing your salvation, all that kind of stuff. All right, now, listen to me very carefully. Um, he says, whatever's done not of faith is sin. Now, look at Galatians 3.12. Whatever's done not of faith is sin. Galatians 3.12 and the law is not of faith. Whoa. So if whatever's done not of faith is sin, and you're still living by the law, it's sin. Well, the Bible says the law produces sin. I'll show you that in a moment. And, he, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. The law is not of faith. It doesn't take faith to live by the law of Moses. It doesn't take faith at all to live by the law of Moses. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 56. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. He said, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. <laughs> what? The law strengthens sin. 
So if you live by the law and the law strengthens sin, do you, do you lose your salvation uh, because you don't, don't understand at the time? I lived by the law for a long time. I didn't know about this gospel of grace. God didn't throw, my, throw me away. I didn't lose my salvation. All right. Look at uh, this in the NLT. Look at this in NLT. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 in the NLT. For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. I, I now understand that living by the Mosaic law, you know, it, it, it was given to bring men, really it was, it was given to hurt you. The law doesn't care anything about you. It, it, it was given to show you how bad you are. And notice again, the sin that's there. So if all of those things are true, then we should have all lost our salvation. All sin is, is on the same level in God's eye. That's the point I want to make. All sin is on the same level in God's eyes. Now, uh, somebody just says, I haven't committed what's considered big sins, but I have broken God's law. I hadn't done the big sins, <laughs> but I have broken God's law. Well, what does the Bible say about that? James 2.10. If you decide that you're going to live by the law, James 2.10 says, James 2.10, he says this, for the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's law. Whew. The law is like a, it's like a, a plated glass window. Uh, I, I, I remember as a, as a, as a little boy, it, me and my friend, had, he just got a BB gun, and we would shoot in a box in the house in front of a glass sliding door. So he hit the box, and I hit the box, and then I took it and aimed, and it fired up, and the BB hit the glass. Okay, so whether you throw a chair through the glass or a BB, the glass still got to be replaced. So we, we wasn't smart. We put a piece of masking tape on it. Uh, took the mother a while to discover it. Took a couple of years, and she called, and you get out of here, I'm going to whoop you. Back in those days, your mother would give other people permission to beat you. I don't understand that, but uh, the whole glass had to be replaced. If a small BB or a big brick it still meant the glass had to be replaced. So if you violate one tiny command, you're guilty of breaking the whole thing. Okay? Now, people who say you have to be holy, you can't have sin in your life, and still think you're saved, you have to categorize it into big sin and little sin in order to even say that. In order to even say that, you've got to say that's a big sin or a little sin. You can't, you can't be holy. You, you just can't have sin in your life and still think you're saved. You can't even say that statement unless you look at sin as big sin, really bad sin, and little sin, kind of insignificant sin. That's the only way you can make that statement because it means you've got to throw away everything that God says about this. You know, uh, let's look at, for example, adultery versus speeding. You know, if the born-again believer who committed adultery and didn't confess it before dying goes straight to hell, then so does every believer who has ever uh, got caught speeding. Everyone, because it's on, it's on the same level. I, I know that's so hard because for so long we've, we've categorized it. This is the big sin, adultery. This is the little sin, speeding. But from God's eyes, it's like it's still sin. If the, big guy, if the guy goes to hell for the big sin and, and the guy don't go to hell for the little sin, God's not a God of justice. Listen to me carefully. So, if that were true, then nobody would make it to heaven because we all come short and fail in many different ways. Nobody would. I mean, that's... Look at Romans 3, 23 in the King James and the New Living Translation. Romans 3, 23. 
we all fall short or we all miss the mark. It shows that place of inferiority in people's lives. He said, for all have sinned and come short. <laughs> everybody's, everybody's sinned and come short. I know that just messes with you. Oh, well, I've never sinned. I don't smoke. I don't, I don't, I don't look at R-rated movies. I don't look at my naked body when I get out of the shower. I don't, I don't do any of those things. All right, so now we got your sin, self-righteous. Self-righteousness is your sin. And self-righteousness is unrighteousness. Please hear me when I, when I say this. Hear me when this word says this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've missed the mark. But that's the part of the process. We're growing. We're getting better than what we used to be. We're, we're not what we used to be. We don't miss the mark like we used to miss the mark. But this, this idea that now that I'm saved, I don't sin anymore, so, so bad. It's just terrible. And what it's done to people and the condemnation and the shame and the guilt that's come on people because there's this idea that now that you're saved, that you are delivered from missing the mark. Now, the problem is, and I don't have time to teach it tonight, is we don't interpret sin right. There's a difference between sin, the nature of sin, that old man, and sinning, the behavior or action of sin. Romans chapter 6 talks about the nature of sin. Every verse in Romans chapter 6 except for one verse. Every verse is a noun. There's only one verse in Romans 6 that's a verb. And what he was talking about is how shall we sin? How shall we sin or how shall we go con continue, how shall we continue in sin when the grace of God has come rescue us? In other words, how can we continue in the old man when we no longer have the old man? So there's a difference between the old man called sin and the behavior or sinning. You are totally and completely delivered from the old man. He has been removed out of your life. You have a new creation. You do not have to follow suit with the old man of sin. Glory to God. And, and guess what? So now you don't have to behave or sin, the verb. You don't have to sin if you don't want to. You had to sin when you had the old man. But now that you got a new creation, you can reject it. Follow me. Let me get on down the line. I don't want to run out of time here. Now, if you can send your salvation away, did we read Romans 3? Yeah, we did. If you can send your salvation away, then the only way to heaven is to die immediately after being born again. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I believe you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now, Lord, kill me. <laughs> that's the only way. If that's the only, and you know that's not true. And yet, that's what somehow has been put in our minds, and that's what makes people holier than thou and walk around with this arrogance of, of judgmentalism where they can look down at another person and forget that that person is in the process, that God is making him holy. God is faithful to make you holy. God is faithful to make you holy. God is faithful to make you holy. He's going to make you holy. And the day you realize that you are the righteousness of God, you're going to want to do right. Your behavior doesn't define who you are. Who you are defines your behavior. Yes. Come on. The Holy Spirit's going to change your desire. He's going to take away the old want-tos. He's going to give you the new want-tos. Glory to be to God. And you're not going to want to. This idea of, well, Brother Dollar, you're just going to, you're telling people this and they're just going to go crazy in sin. No, they won't. They're going to finally recognize, wait a minute, I don't have to do this if I don't want to. And they'll be free from the condemnation and the shame and the guilt and the fear. And they'll know that no matter what happens, God hadn't left them. He hadn't stopped loving them. They didn't lose their salvation. All is going to be well. And the Holy Spirit's going to begin to work on the inside of you. See, we don't factor in the Holy Spirit when we're doing this stuff. It's just a bunch of religious rules and regulations that bring shame and condemnation on people. So since salvation depends solely upon putting your faith in Jesus and being born again, your sin doesn't affect your relationship with God as far as your righteousness and salvation is concerned. Now, let, me, let me make sure you understand that. Faith is the key issue here. 
Your salvation depends solely on putting your faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you got born again. Not nothing you did, it was by grace. Not nothing you deserved, it was by grace. Now, behaving wrong can affect you. It could bring about shame. It could deal with your confidence in God. You'll start questioning whether God loves you. Yeah. When you miss the mark in some things, yeah, you're going, oh, God, I disappointed God. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't know if he loves me. I'm shameful. My heart is hardened. All these things can happen to you. But there's one thing that won't happen. You won't lose your salvation. Now, next week I'm going to show you that uh, you can uh, turn over your salvation, but you have to qualify to do that. <laughs> And not many people qualify to be able to do that. Uh, once saved, always saved is, is, is not a, a Bible thing. It, um, because there are a lot of things that you can do to turn that over, but you really, you have to qualify to be able to, to do something like that. So next, next uh, Wednesday is going to be very, very exciting. You can renounce your salvation, but you have to qualify. You can renounce your salvation. Say, I don't believe you no more. I don't want Jesus no more. Get out of my life. And you can say all that, but there are, there are like six things you have to do in order for it to be accepted. <laughs> That's the grace of God. Even when you start talking like a fool, God already got your back up <laughs> to do what needs to be done. And Hebrews 6, I think, 4, 6, we'll look at that next week. But uh, uh, what was I saying? Okay, so salvation is determined strictly by your belief. It's, it's not determined, you know, I, I'm saved. I'm saved today. And when you do stupid stuff, you're still saved. Now, you, 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 you know, you, you may be feeling a little funny about what you did, and you may, you know, feel convicted about what you did, and that's, and that's good. But God's committed to making you holy. You know, I'm convinced that sometimes God allows us to go through things so that we can grow from those things that we go through. Now, he would love for you to just listen to what he says and believe him. <laughs> it's not like that. I think about some of the things, if I'd have just listened to what God said and believed him, I would not have had to go through some things. You know, he, he talks about trials if need be. And I'm like, you know, I, I needed them, I guess, because it got my attention. It got my attention. One of the things that also got my attention is the fact that you know, when God begins to, to work with you and change your desires and, 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 and take away your old want-tos and give you new want-tos, you know, he is the one that's going to make the difference in your life if we give him a chance. Stop trying to do God's job. Okay, you're going to look a little later on. It's going to be by faith that you get what grace is made available. Somebody says, well, do I not do nothing? No, it's by faith that things are made available. So I'm going to confess the word, all right? I'm going to confess what grace is made available to me. I'm going to believe what grace is made available to me. I'm going to call things that be not according to what grace is made available to me. See, you don't get this grace except by faith. And so the Jesus Christ and, and, and allowing us to be born again, that's the grace of God but you had to release your faith and say, Lord, I believe it, and I receive you right now into my life, and now you're born again. Don't question that anymore. You're born again. You're a Christian. You gave your heart to Jesus. You are a born-again Christian. Now, be careful that you don't let the devil start whispering in your ear after you miss the mark in some area of your life. Be careful that you don't hear the words of condemnation. You're no good for the kingdom anymore. And, and then what happens, you compare yourself with somebody else. You say, wow, man, if I hadn't missed the mark, that could have been me. God's God really blessing them, but that could have been me. How many of you have ever experienced God blessing you and you know you didn't deserve it? I mean, uh, uh, there's something in your life, something happened, you're like, I, I don't even know where that came from. I know. <laughs> and it changed your mind. That's what the Bible says. He says that, uh, that um, the goodness of God will cause a man to repent. So God knows how to change your mind. So you're thinking only the goody-goody two-shoes are getting the blessings from God. God, God, this coming Sunday, I'm going to show you something that blew my mind. 
that the cross of Jesus Christ not only provided things for us, but it also provided something for God. I said, what? The cross provided something for God? Yeah, had Jesus not gone to the cross, you and I would have never been born again, and God would have never been able to do what I'm going to tell you Sunday that he's not able to do because of Jesus. <laughs> Y'all were waiting on it, weren't you? Yeah. Nah, you need to come to church, man. Does everybody see what I'm saying here now? So, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to block these off in little small sermons, and uh, we'll start off uh, next week uh, talking about this. Let me, let me end with this right here. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 in the King James and the New Living Translation. Since salvation depends solely upon putting your faith in Jesus and being born again, your sin doesn't affect your relationship with God. It may affect you, and it could lead you to shame, and it could lead you to idolatry. You could start valuing things more than God. It could lead you to unwanted consequences. It could lead you to a hardened heart. But here's the, here's the thing about it. It won't affect your relationship with God as far as your being saved is concerned. He fellowships with you based on your faith in Christ alone. God fellowships with you based on your faith in Christ alone. There have been some days that I didn't have perfect days, some days where I missed the mark and God was still talking to me. You know what blew my mind? You remember when Cain killed Abel? I don't know if you recognize this. Cain killed Abel and God started talking to him. Oh, God, God was just talking to him the whole time. Like ain't nothing happened. <laughs> God just talked to him. And then they were like, well, we're going to, we're going to kill Cain for killing Abel. And God says, I'm going to put a mark on Cain. And please let me straighten this out. That's not where black people came from. <laughs> I heard that in Bible study. I heard, I heard that the reason why black people are black people is because God put a mark on Cain and it spread it on his body and he became black. And I was in, I was in, a, in a conference one time and, and a minister got up and said, let's pray for our black brothers that the curse will be removed off him. Well, like, what? I ain't going to turn colors. I mean, what you, what you trying to? I'm like, don't pray for me. I ain't got no curse on me. I ain't got no curse on me. The day I got born again, all the curses got, got rid of. God got rid of all the curse. The curse has been removed. Ain't no curse on me. That's not what that was. There was an actual mark that was put on Cain that when you saw that mark, you knew, don't touch him. That's God's mark on this man. And God promised, if you touch him, you're going to have to deal with me. But I was blown away. You are sitting here talking to a man who just murdered his brother, God. Whew. Man, don't miss Sunday. It's just a whole big gap that has been open for a 40 years of my ministry that it needs to be closed and dealt with. Something that restrained God from his full operation of love that only Jesus could satisfy and remove the handcuffs off God. So God could have an operation of unrestrained love. And that's part of the definition of grace is unrestrained love love. And what was it that restrained God from loving man the way he wanted to love man? That restraint has been moved. So I want you to know that God can love you today, and there is nothing that restrains him from his amazing, awesome, unmerited love. He can love you. He can love you into a place where you will make a decision to accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. He can love you. God died for the world, the whole world. He died for the whole world, praise God. He was the sin, Jesus was the sacrifice for sin and the payment for the whole world. He's just now trying to get the whole world to see some of y'all have accepted me and some of y'all have not. Please accept me. That's all you got to do, accept me, and I'll handle the rest. Accept me. I'll, 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 I'll save you. Uh, make me your Lord. 
I'll deliver you. Make me your Lord. I I'll change your desires. Make me your Lord. I I'll make you holy. I'll do it. I'm faithful. You can depend on me. I'm going to do this thing. Oh, my goodness. And so he's told us, our part to play in soul winning, when was the last time you ministered to someone, maybe even in your family? When was the last time you shared Jesus with somebody? The only way you go to hell. Yeah, I'll say that, Lord. Okay, take a deep breath. Okay, you, you ready? Okay. If anybody in here goes to hell for sin, everybody in here is going to hell. How do you say that? You don't go to hell for sin. This man, this man's going to be a whole lot of these days. What you, you don't go to hell for sin. You go to hell for rejecting Jesus Christ. You go to hell for rejecting what Jesus paid for you to have. Everybody in hell rejects Jesus. I know this is messing up your tradition. Those of you on the stream, y'all going crazy. Y'all about cussing by now, aren't you? You don't go to hell for sin. You go to hell for rejecting Jesus, and you go to hell for rejecting the gift of forgiveness. Jesus paid a ransom that had to be paid, and he did it so you could be born again, and you won't accept what he bled and died and went to hell so you can have. He is the propitiation for our sin. He is the payment for your sin. He is the, 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 the sin offering. And you got enough nerve to say, not interested. Well, you, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? No, I, I can't say I do. Oh! Oh, you think you're just cute, huh? You just think, you just think oh, no, I don't, I, I'm an atheist. You cry when you say that. Ain't going to be no happy atheist in hell. Jesus will give you desires to do what pleases him. But he needs your faith. You know, he gave you faith, too. He gave you some faith so you can believe. Believe Jesus. Get saved. Give him your life. Get born again. Make him your Lord and Savior. And if you should miss the mark, get up. Dust yourself off and go forward. I don't care how bad it is. You know, there are three things you're going to see when you get to heaven. Number one, you're going to look around and not see some people you thought they, you knew they were going to get there and you don't even see them. Huh? Number two, you're going to see some people that ain't no way in the world. How in the world they got here? <laughs> and number three, you're going to look around and say, thank God I'm here. <laughs> it's, To say that you're missing the mark can stop Jesus from being who he is is to say that your sin is greater than his blood and your sin is greater than him. This is the thing I got to get in people's head. Get Jesus. He'll take care of you. He'll teach you. He'll work. He is faithful. To do the job. Well, Brother Dollar, you just don't know what I did. I, 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 don't, I don't care. You're still saved. Well, you just, you just you don't understand how many times I did it. <laughs> See, the only thing you're affecting, now here's the deal, here's the problem with that, so that you won't think that you can just go do anything. The problem with that is the more you keep doing it, the harder your heart gets till you wake up one day and you have no sensitivity towards the things of God anyway. Now, he's trying to help you, but your heart has become so hardened because you continue to willingly do the stuff when the Spirit of God is saying, stop it, don't do that. He's talking to you, don't do that. Leave that alone, and you're just ignoring it and going doing it again. Please understand, grace is not a license to sin, but it, 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 it will teach you how not to. It will teach you 
how to live a godly and a sober and a righteous life. See, the thing we're missing is we have no confidence in the Spirit of God to be able to do this. We only had confidence in our rule keeping and what we got to do to make this happen. So, can sin cause you to lose your salvation? No. No. If I was a betting man, I put some money on the table, I'd go through the whole scripture with it is nowhere in there. Doesn't happen. Well, this scripture here, you were probably not reading it in context. That's most of the problem when people say, no, but this scripture say this, and I sit down with them, I say, let's read the chapter before and the chapter uh, in, that is included. Context is king. And if you miss it, you're probably missing it in context. And uh, it's not there. It's not there. Now, Hebrews 6, 4, 6, we will talk about that because that's the only place where it talks about renouncing your salvation. And I'll show you next week how you have to be a strong Christian. You got to operate in all the gifts of the Spirit. You got to have revelation knowledge flowing. You got to have all these things happen before you can even qualify uh, to, to even renounce it, you know. And not many people do. I don't know anybody that has done that. Um, I know some people that tried to do it, and God just came on in with his mercy and just, just blessed them and just made them made an awesome thing. That's all the time I have tonight. You get anything out of that tonight? Um, let's, let's just do that right now. If you, if you are here and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or if you're watching through the stream, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'd like to lead you in this simple prayer that takes seconds. This simple prayer that takes seconds, not even a minute. And if you'll pray this prayer with me, I'll lead you into the throne of God as you accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. Say this after me, Heavenly Father. I realize that I'm a sinner, but right now I repent of my sins. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart. I believe in you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, I am saved. If you prayed that simple prayer with me tonight, I want to welcome you to the kingdom of God. I want to welcome you to the family of God. Now it's time to grow and learn of him and understand who he is and all of those wonderful things that are involved. And so um, I'm thankful. We are going to be talking grace we're going to be talking grace on Sundays. We're going to be talking grace on Wednesdays. We're going to be talking grace on the morning confessions. We are going to be talking grace until you get it, that you're going to bump into so much scripture that I'm bound to run out whatever the religion is or the bad teaching is, it will hit it. But I want you to be, you know what? In Titus, it, it talks about grace teaching us in and and, and verse 11 and then 12, but then in 13, he says, that we should look for the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the thing that should be taking place uh, before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I signed up for it. I told God I'm here, ready to do it. You can keep me here as long as you want to, 120, 130, but just make sure I'm not, you know, can't get around and make sure everything's working right and all that, <laughs> you know, all that stuff is what needs to be done. But I am so excited about the gospel of grace being preached here at our church, and we are going to flood the atmosphere with Jesus, 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 Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So uh, next week, uh, we're going to talk about the truth about once saved, always saved. We're going to look at the truth about once saved, always saved. And uh, we'll just move into this thing every Wednesday night. Um, Sunday's going to be amazing. Do not, do not miss it. Do not miss it. If you can't get to church, make sure you, you turn your streams on. It is going to be one of the most important messages I've ever preached before in my life because I have seven powerful ways to try to define grace. We're going we're gonna to look at the definition again. What is it? And all of the things that God wants to do in our life where that is concerned. Absolutely marvelous. Welcome to Grace Institute for the next year. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Y'all make some noise. Praise God for our salvation.
If you prayed the prayer of salvation, uh, we want you to text I'm saved, one word, uh, to 51555. Provide your name and email address, and we'll send you a free ebook as a gift uh, for you today. It is now time for offering. Come on. There you go. You see, offering, there's a scripture, I think it's 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 6, and 7, but it talks about being a cheerful giver. Well, you can only give from a cheerful place based off of how you view God and then how you view your money. Your relationship is a place where you give from cheerfully, okay? This is not about bondage. It's not about, oh, well, I need this and I got to do this or I got to give to receive and anything like that. Giving is kind of synonymous with agape love. Understanding his love for you and your love for him. So at this time, we're going to pass out offering envelopes. If you raise your hand, if you need one. Or we have several ways. I believe we have the QR code that's on the screen. You just hold your phone up and it'll give you a link. You can give that way. Or you can text the world changers plus the amount to 74483. Or you can call 1 866 477 7683. Or you can mail it to 2500 Birdette Road, College Park, Georgia 30349. Or you can go to worldchangers.org or Creflo Dollar Ministries. Dot org to give. So if you need an offering envelope, the ushers are handing them out. They're coming to you. I see the hands in the back. All right. Wasn't that a good message? Man, you know, God is good, man. Dr. Dollar don't miss, do he? It's just a Wednesday night, man. He gave us some Sunday word on Wednesday night, man. That's, man, I'm like, Jesus, he just back to back to back. Anyways, let's pray over the offering. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for this seed. We pray for a hundredfold return on it. And I declare, Lord God, that it is blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we'll get ready to dismiss. I want to pray over you before we dismiss. Father God, I declare and decree that everybody under the sound of my voice, that their minds and hearts are immersed in your love and that they stay mindful of just how much you love them to the point where when bad news comes or when circumstances come, that their response is a victorious response and that their words are words of victory. I declare that so over their lives right now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Love you guys. You are dismissed. You asked and we answered. We know there are friends of the ministry who prefer CDs and DVDs. But for those of you who find the digital versions of messages better fit your life, Creflo and Taffy Dollar's message series are now available as digital downloads in the CYWE store. Log on to CYWEstore.com today to see the whole catalog of new and re-release messages that can be downloaded to any device for easy and convenient listening.